Lord. And we do love him. We love to fellowship with him. And that's why we came here this morning. Your friends are here, people you know, but the guy you really came to see is Jesus Christ. That's the guy you really came to be with. And we are going to have communion this morning. There's a little table back there if you haven't gotten yourself a little, it's a little container, it's got the wafer and the wine in it, so it's, they're sitting back there. So I had a message a while back that I thought would be a good one for a day like this. And some things that were brought up recently and the Lord had been speaking to me about. When you think about communion and you think about Jesus and you think about the price he paid and you think about the men that served him in the early church and you know what was going through their minds and what they thought about. And the title of this one is The Fellowship of His Sufferings. So I'm going to read a passage that I, I'd never read this before, and it surprised me when I read it. <clears throat> it's from Jeremiah 30. He says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. And the city shall be builded upon her own heap. Think about that. They'd been invaded. I mean, Jerusalem was laid waste. It did not, as Jesus had said, not one stone was left upon another. It was just rubble. And when God talked about restoring Jerusalem, he said, I'm going to build them right back where they were. Now, that's, don't, don't try and make a doctrine out of this. But God loves to restore things. He loves to take things that man thinks he could destroy or he could lay waste or he could wipe off the face of the earth so no one would ever remember it. God loves to come back in and just say, I'm still God. And it says, The palace shall remain after the manner thereof, and out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of them that make merry. And I will multiply them and they will not be few. Love that. I will glorify them, they shall not be small. God loves restoration, but just if you read the book of Job, which is one of those books that a lot of people read and kind of mull it over what it's talking about, he went through a lot, no question. He lost everything he had. I mean, there wasn't anything left to lose by the time it was over. And yet when it was done, it said the latter end of Job was greater than the beginning and better than his former state. So God is a restorer, but he doesn't just restore what used to be. He brings it back in a much more powerful and a much more real way, and that's what he did with him. He says, Their children shall be as before time, and their congregation shall be established before me. And their nobles shall be of themselves. Now, talking about rulers, he says, out of his people, God will raise up leaders right out of their midst. He says, their governor will proceed from the midst of them. And he says, I'll cause them to draw near this people, and they shall approach unto me. Now, all of that I've read in different contexts, in different verses, at different times in the Word of God. Here's the one that caught my attention. For who is this, says the Lord, that has engaged his heart to approach unto me? I love that. Jesus was on this earth ministering for three and a half years, but he had 30 years of preparation that went into that. And during that time, he grew up. 
And there's a lot of things that went on in that time that really aren't recorded in the Word, what exactly the day-to-day was like. But there's a lot of things in the Word that talk about Jesus when He came to this earth and what He did in order to come here and the way that He came and the manner in which He came. And it really points to somebody letting go of everything for one purpose. You know, a lot of people point out, well, Jesus never got married and had children. Well, that's not quite true. (laughs) Because He definitely had a plan for a marriage. And it's coming. So God says these people are going to approach unto me. They're going to come before me. They're going to, they're going to draw near to me. They're going to love spending time where I am. But he says they're going to have to engage their heart to do this. That means that the way a man is just First of all, man is born into sin in this earth. They need to come to the Lord. They need to be cleansed in that blood. They need to be forgiven of their sin. They need to come into the family of God. Then they need to receive a Holy Ghost baptism, speaking in tongues, and that gives them an anointing in their life. And now they have an avenue to approach God. But still, the heart of man. There's things that God values so much in a heart. He talks talks about it in Isaiah 66 and I love this passage because he says thus saith the Lord the heavens my throne the earth is my footstool but where is the house that you build unto me and where is the place of my rest he says for I made the heavens and the earth he said my hand formed all that you realize his hand formed man Everything that God created in, in Genesis, when you, when you read in Genesis, those days of creation, it said, and God said, and there it was. Even the animals, everything. Man alone, it says that God took of the dust of the earth and formed it. Then he breathed into it. And that man became a living soul. So there was something about the man that was very different from everything else. And the real secret of man was that man was the only thing that had really the choice of his own destiny in his own hands. Beasts couldn't do that. And so God being God wanted something in his creation that would have to choose him. And that would be a resting place for him. The communion that he had with Adam after after that sixth day, when Adam was created at the end of that sixth day, the seventh day was a day of rest. Did you ever wonder why that was immediately after he created man? I hadn't really thought about that. And I was sitting in a meeting and someone mentioned that, that, you know, right after God made man, then he needed a day of rest. And the Lord spoke to me and said, that took a lot out of me. And I had never thought about it that way. That creating man, he just spoke and all these things that we see in the earth were created, but when it came to making man, he actually actually took the dust, the things in the earth that he had made, and he, he shaped them. You know, he wanted to make this man look just like him. He shaped all that and formed it into an image of himself. And then he actually breathed his own spirit into that being and it came to life as a spirit being. That took something from the Lord. And so in the light of that, he says... What am I looking for? He says, this is what I look for. Even to him that is a poor and a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. That's a place of rest. That's where God finds communion. That's where he finds fellowship. 
he had that with Adam until Adam disobeyed him. And when he lost it with Adam, his goal was to get it back. In Psalm 51, after David had sinned with Bathsheba, and after the prophet had come and spoken to him and God had passed judgment on Israel and David had to watch it all happen because of what he did, how do you think he felt? And so he's sitting there, he says, you don't want sacrifice. He said, I'd give sacrifice if that would do it. He said, you don't want another burnt offering either. He says, the only sacrifices you want are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. He says, God, this you will not turn away from. And he knew the weight of what he'd done. He saw the effect it had on Israel. He saw the judgment that fell on his own house. And so when Jesus came into the world, he said these same words here that David had said. He said, sacrifice and offering, that's not what you wanted. But a body have you prepared me. The one that God sent into this earth to be the last Adam. Now, I, I, I try and get a picture of this in, in heaven, in the heavenly realm, because the Father's with the Son, with the Holy Ghost. He says, Son, you're, you're going to do something different here. I'm going to send you down there. You're going to look just like them. You're going to let go of everything, everything, all the glory that's up here. In fact, you're going to actually be born of a woman and it's going to be messy just like every other birth that happens down there that's how yours is going to look and you're going to grow up and you're going to look just like they do now that's one thing when you're standing before God in heaven in the glory and he's telling you all this but then when that seed went down into the earth and he was born of a woman and he was a baby, and they did lay him in a cow manger with the hay. It wasn't what you call a glorious kind of birth, except for the fact of what was going on in heaven when he was born. And how God was speaking to even shepherds in the fields. The most despised group of people, shepherds. And angels came to them and said, go see what's happening underneath that star there. And so he said, I come to do your will. And he prefaced that. He said, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. What was he doing for 30 years? He was trying to figure out who he was. You think, did Jesus have to figure that out? Well, It says in Philippians here, I'm just going to jump and then I'll jump back. It says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, in heaven, eternal glory, from the beginning, the word was there in the beginning of creation. God spoke his word, all these things were created. He was that eternal word. who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, you don't have to cheat. You don't have to deceive people. You don't have to pull the wool over their eyes to make them think you're the son of God. That you're truly who you say you are. And so he came to earth and it says he made himself of no reputation. There's a lot of ways to translate that or to think about that, but he emptied himself. He let go of all the glory he had in heaven, let go of everything that he'd known throughout eternity with the Father, and let it all go. Think of the first Adam. God formed him out of the dust of the ground. God breathed into him. He was the first man. 
He disobeyed God. And yet God allowed him to live. Lived almost 900 plus years there. The first Adam. But there were consequences, of course. You know, he was driven out of the garden. He had to earn his living by the sweat of his face. I mean, life wasn't easy after he left the garden. His first two sons, one rose up and killed the other. And then the one that killed the other took off and did his own thing. Life wasn't a bed of roses after that, for that first Adam. But the last Adam, when he came, did not deserve to die, did not rebel against his father, and yet chose to pay a price. That's why it meant something. And it's talking about it here because he says, I come in to do your will. And it says above when he said, you know, it's not sacrifice, it's not burnt offering, that's not what you wanted, that's not what you had pleasure in. He said, I come to do your will. Jesus understood that the sacrifices of God were a broken and a contrite heart. He understood that. He learned that. And he learned it because he grew up. For 30 years on this earth, he grew up. He worked a job. He lived as part of a family. He had a mother and a father. He had brothers and sisters. Think about that. All that time. And, you, and, and as he was growing up, there were other kids his age where he lived. What did they think of him? What did anybody think of him? When he was 12 years old, he's in the temple talking to the priests and the elders, and they're saying, Where, how does he understand all these things? They thought he was weird. What do you think the kids thought? What do you think the friends or other kids that he knew in the neighborhood thought of him? What do you think they thought of him all that time while he was growing up? How do kids react to someone like that? They think they're weird. They think they're strange. They'll generally socially ostracize them. Not much want to do with them. Anybody like that. He emptied himself. And he began to feel what it's like to serve God in the middle of a perverse generation. A world that was under the bondage of sin. And he began to understand that he was actually going to be the one that could change the course of all of that. It's an amazing thing to think that he says, I come to do your will, O Lord. It says, he taketh away the first. He took away the burnt offerings, the sacrifices, and the rituals, and all what was laid out in the law where man could approach and the high priest would go in once a year and offer the sacrifice and sprinkle the people with blood. He took that away so that he could establish the second by his own choice. By him bearing the reproach of being a called one, a called out one, someone with a vision and a mission for his life that was hard to put into words and express to people. But he was here, and God had sent him here, and he'd become aware of why he was here and what the Lord wanted him to do. And it says, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Because of the choices he made. When he came on the scene in Nazareth, when he went into the temple that day and began to preach to them and say who he was Understand, he had never said those words before about himself. He had never stood up anywhere and said that 
the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He had never said those words before. That was the first time it ever came out of him. What do you think they thought? It says they led him to the brow of the hill where on the city was built to cast him off. They couldn't fathom it. They couldn't process it. But he had. He had done that. For those 30 years, growing up, reading the scriptures over and over again. What does this mean? What's this talking about? And, and seeing passages like Isaiah 53. Seeing passages like Psalm 22. Those made him think. And it, of course it brought to remembrance what the Lord had told him he was going to do on this earth. Ephesians 1.17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said, I pray this endlessly, endlessly for my church, for anyone I come in contact with, anywhere I've gone to minister. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Is there any other knowledge in this earth that we crave? If you're in business, you know you're always researching your business. You're always trying to find new information, better ways to do things. I mean, knowledge right now is so cheap in this earth. You can, you can access any information about anything you want right from here. I mean, you don't have to go anywhere. We used to have to go to a library to look stuff like that up. Now it's just everywhere. It's, it's, it's dime a dozen practically in this earth. But this wisdom and this revelation and this knowledge of Him only comes by fellowship. It only comes by choice. It comes through desire. It says through desire a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Where does that wisdom come from? It comes from the feet of the Master. It comes from spending time there and hearing Him and calling on Him and laying yourself before Him. It's, it's really, you're modeling what Jesus did when he came to this earth. You empty yourself. You let go of that old nature. Because Jesus redeemed it. Man's pri man, men walk this earth in a prison of themselves. They are their own worst enemy. But when Jesus Christ comes into your life, he sets you free from you. That's the biggest deliverance. You're set free from yourself. You're set free from who you thought you were. You're set free from what you thought you were. And suddenly you know life is never going to be the same. I was 17 when I got saved, and all I knew was that life would never be the same. I couldn't think of a single person I knew who was ever going to look at me the same again. I mean, I just knew that. And if you didn't know that yet in your own life, you need to get saved and then you will know what that feels like because that's what it feels like. And so when Jesus made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. And I like this, the way that, you know, the King James sometimes in their translation, they just inadvertently tap into something so key he says, and being found in fashion as a man. Okay, now there's two things about that. Who found him in fashion as a man? He found himself. He said, I look just like these guys. I'm about the same size they are. My body's subject to a lot of the same things their bodies are subject to. He realized that what, what, what God had done, that he had given him a body. Not sacrifice and offering. No, you're going to go down there and you're going to do my will. And you're going to do what the first Adam should have done. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He didn't gripe. He didn't say, why have you done this to me? 
And he says he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow, every tongue would confess. The power in the name of Jesus didn't come because he was the Son of God for all eternity. It didn't come because the heavens and earth were created through the Word. It came because of the choices he made when he was on this earth. To redeem something, a person has to choose to redeem something. Whether it's your own life, whether it's your family, whether it's the country or the nation you live in, whether it's world events that are taking place, whatever it is that you want to have influence over, you have to choose that. You have to believe that. You have to take hold of God for that. Those are choices men must make. And it won't happen any other way. It's not an automatic thing. And Paul prayed in Philippians 3. I love this passage. He said that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, do you think Paul had any intention of going to a cross and being crucified? I don't think that's what he was talking about. Although I know in his heart there's nothing he would not have done for Jesus Christ. He ended up being martyred. I don't think it was his intention, but he was willing to die for the Lord if if that's what was going to happen to him. But he's talking about something different here. When he talks about the fellowship of suffering, it's it's like if, if you know somebody who's gone through something that you've gone through, and you're with that person, there's a connection immediately because there's something that you have in common there that you have both gone through and you're still here. In other words, it didn't kill you. And you actually came out on the other side and went on with life and life got better. That's a natural example of what he's talking about here. Paul was a Pharisee. Somewhere there, I think it was in 1st or 2nd Corinthians, he lists his credentials. And he said, I counted it as all as dung. He emptied himself. He let go of it all. He just said, don't, don't need that anymore. That's not me. That's not who I am. That's not where my life springs from anymore. I don't look to that. It's my security blanket anymore. He said, I want to know him and I want to know the fellowship of what he endured to do what he did. I want to know that. What was the price he paid? What was going through his mind when he said, sacrifice and offering? No, you gave me a body. When he realized that, what went through his mind? What was he thinking? What was he letting go of? What was, what was the Son of God doing with that information that God had given him a body and that he had to do his will? What was that going to mean to him? And he says, that I may know him. If you want the power of his resurrection, and we do, this earth needs the power of his resurrection. The church needs to demonstrate the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's our calling. It's our duty. It's what we're here for. But it says, the way to know that is to know the fellowship of His sufferings. What did He endure? Because it says, He was made in the likeness of men. Get that. God used us as a pattern. 
to send the Son of God to the earth. See, we were made in God's image. But when Jesus came to earth, he was made in our image. Wrap your head around that. Wrap your head around that. Everything the Son of God endured is a key, it's a ticket, it's an answer, it's a way, it's an avenue, it's access to the Father. Every single thing. And I like, I'm going to skip ahead here into Colossians. He says, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. He said, I, Paul, have been made into something that I was not. And that is, I am a minister of this eternal gospel now and the hope of this gospel. So he goes on to describe what that hope is. He says, And I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. What did he mean by that? He said, I let go of my status. Let go of my family heritage. I let go of my education. I let go of everything so that I could live the rest of my life to find this gospel that had arrested my life so rudely that day on the road to Damascus. That's his suffering for people then that he ministered to. He said, I just let it all go, guys. Any power that was strong enough to reverse the course of his life, he said, I'm going to find out what that was. I'm going to know what that was. And I'm going to carry that to the end of the earth and I will pay any price. I will bear any burden. I'll be Winston Churchill. I'll pay any price. I'll bear any burden. We've got to win this fight. And he meant it. He said, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. He says, whatever I've got to do, whatever price I've got to pay, whatever's got to change in my life, whatever blinders have to come off my eyes, whatever God's calling me to do, I'm willing. I'll do it. I will pay that price. I will gladly lay down this life because the one that called me did that. And so he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. And here's this next line is very significant. He says, and I will fill up that which is behind or lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. And what's he saying there is, I want to know it all. He said, I don't know it all yet, but I want to know it all. He says, if there's any anything of the sufferings of Christ, he says, that I am not in communion with right now, he said, I want to make sure I understand it. I want to pursue him till I have that fellowship. He says, I want to know everything he thought. I want to know how he thought. I want to know what made him tick because it's going to make me tick. If we're going to make it in this end time, it's going to be because we know exactly what was going through his mind as he walked this earth and what he did. It says, you have the mind of Christ. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also. When he says, let it, okay, it's like, it's like having a dog in a cage. Someone says, let the dog out. The dog's there. Let him out of the cage. He says, let this mind be in you. You have this mind. You possess it. Jesus paid for that. You have it. He says, let it be in you, which was in him, so that you can think as he thought, so that you could fellowship with everything that was going through his mind as he laid down his life, as he gave up the glory that he had in heaven, as he came to this earth, as he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, as all these things were going on, you begin to commune with that. That's what Paul was doing. He talked, 
He spent more time talking about that than anything else he talked about. And he says, again, after saying this, he says, whereof I am made a minister. So he knew what his calling was. It was to communicate Jesus Christ, the man, the one that came to this earth, that gave it all to redeem mankind and held back nothing. He said, that's what I'm a minister of. And he said, according to the dispensation of God that's given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now it's made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See that a little differently? Christ in you? We all know about the guy on the white horse from Revelation 19. But there was the lamb that stood in the midst of the seven gold candlesticks too. There was this Jesus. Who understood that the sacrifices of God were a broken and a contrite spirit. He understood that. He played it out in the garden, guys, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He played it out. He said, Lord, if there's any other way. So I'm going back to first or to Philippians three here. He says, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. He said, I want my mind to be so conformed to him that I understand why he went to the cross. That I could feel and understand what redemption felt like as he was hanging on that cross. He says, I want to conform my own mind to that. I want to understand that. He says, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Now here's where I was talking about before. He says, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He said, this guy apprehended me. Very bluntly, very suddenly. Mark talked about suddenly recently. For Paul, it was pretty sudden. He was on the road to kill, and all of a sudden he was blind and helpless as a baby, laying in the dirt, and he couldn't even see what happened, but he could hear a voice. He knew that this, that what had happened to him, he said, the rest of my life, every breath I have, as long as I have breath in me, I will pursue, I will seek, I will go to, I will call upon him that did this to me so that I can understand who he is and what he's doing in me so that I can do what he did. He says, I want to apprehend what apprehended me. He says, brethren, I do not consider myself to have apprehended. He said, I don't know it yet. I don't understand it all yet. He said, this one thing I do. Forgetting the things that are behind me and reaching forth into the things that are before me, I press toward the mark for the prize 
of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. So that was his life. You talk about being consumed by something. Paul was consumed by a vision. He was consumed by a mission. He was consumed by a purpose. And he was consumed most of all with love for Jesus Christ, the one that had done the unthinkable for man. That man couldn't even comprehend it. That God would send his son down here in our image to pay a price for us. Bowsers. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your, con your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Enduring. He says, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, if we begin to see his mind and his heart and understand the price he paid, and we have fellowship with that, and we are not afraid of that reproach, and we don't run from it. He says, if those things abound in you, so also the consolation, because God sent the comforter, the consoler, the, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, who would bring all things to our remembrance, who would be with us constantly, everywhere we go, everyone we come in contact with, that Spirit is there, that, cons that Spirit of consolation. He's there with us. And he says it's effectual in the enduring of these sufferings which we suffer. Because that's the thing when it talks in James about enduring temptation. It doesn't just mean going through it. It means coming out on the other side. And not having compromised. Not having sinned. Not having cursed God. Not having gone back on what you believe. But you, you, you face a situation in life and you use the nature of Jesus Christ to go through and understand. And when you're done, you have not compromised your existence. You have not embarrassed Him. You've honored Him. You've endured temptation. You know, every time you endure a temptation and handle it rightly, you're honoring the Lord Jesus Christ because He said, by the which will we were sanctified. So when we make those same choices, guys, we are honoring him. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. First Adam deserved to die for what he had done, yet God let him live. Second Adam deserved glory. Deserved rewards. And yet he chose to die. Totally, totally didn't deserve it. Not a bit of it. He didn't have it coming, as they say in this earth. But he took it. That's redemption. When we celebrate communion, Jesus Christ, that's what we're celebrating. That's fellowship of his sufferings. So, uh, just some piano music, maybe. Um, if anybody hasn't uh, pulled one of those little cups back there, you can go get that now. And if you, if you have them, then we can go ahead here with this part of the service. I will never, for one, ever think of the body of Christ the same when I think about really what he did. 
what his body meant to us. But just by assuming, by taking on, by being found in fashion as a man, what he did. Just understanding that. Understanding all of the things that he endured for 30 years growing up. Because, let me tell you, it wasn't just going to happen. that He was going to understand the will of God, the eternal God, and how God wanted to do everything. It wasn't going to come automatically. He was going to have to find it out. And he said in the volume of the book, how many times do you think he read it? How many hours of his life were spent on his knees searching, reading these things, saying, God, what is this talking about? Is this me? I could never think of the body and the blood of Jesus like, like I used to. Because that very body meant so much to us. If he hadn't taken on that form and been found in fashion as a man, we had no hope. If he came here as God, there was no redemption. He had to come as a representation. Remember, God made Adam in his image, but when Jesus came here, God sent him in the form of our image. He had to take on our image if he was going to redeem us, guys. It couldn't come any other way. It couldn't come any other way. It wouldn't have been fair. It wouldn't have been right. It wouldn't have been just. If he had an advantage in some way, it wouldn't have been true redemption. Fact is, he gave it all up. So there would be no advantage. So, you know, Jesus said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And he had a loaf of bread and chalice of wine at the time for the for the disciples there. But uh, peel off that little thing on the top. And Lord, thank you for your body. Your body that was broken for us for remission of sin. Thank you that when you took that body that for those years that you lived in that body you never made a wrong choice. You made right choices. Thank you that you saw each and every one of us in that body. Yes, from heaven you could look down on earth and behold creation, but when you were down here in the form of we were in, you saw us. And you saw generations to come just as well in the garden. Thank you, Lord, that you took on a body. Let's take Thank you, Lord. When they took that body, when he let them take it, I should say, they couldn't take it. <laughs> the minute they walked into the garden there, he let them know, you can't just take this body. He just said, I am. Down they went. He said, okay guys, get up. I'll go with you. They abused that body every way they could imagine. They ran him into a kangaroo court. They didn't have any evidence to present. 
it was illegal to hold a ceremony or a court ceremony at that time in the way they did it. They brought in witnesses that contradicted each other. Even Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. Because there wasn't any. And the fact that it could come from him, a sinner, a wicked man, even a wicked judge, was proof of the redemption that was in Jesus Christ. They spit on him. They stripped his clothes off him, put a robe on him, a purple robe, and gave him a reed from a pond like that was his scepter. And then they took it out of his hands and beat him with that reed. And then they said, hey, let's flog him. What the heck? Let's, let's, let's use this body up. That was their mindset, and that was also the Father's plan. 39 was the most you could take. 40 would kill a man. They knew that. So he was already, blood was all over his body as he was led to the cross. It was already ripped in more ways than you can imagine. And when they put him on the cross, I've, I've read a couple of different accounts of how they do it, but they nail him to the cross beam. The other part of the cross is in the ground already. They nail him to the cross beam and they take the cross beam, it has a little hanger on it, and they take that Two guys hold it up and they drop it onto the other post. And the point is to create impact. Because what that does, it rips every tendon and every joint in the arms and through the chest, just rips it all. The arms have no strength. Nothing works after that. You're literally hanging there by your flesh and by what's left. Your muscles are stretched all out of proportion. Then they nail the feet. And uh, still it takes them a long time to die. But Jesus, it says he gave up the ghost. First he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that, again, is critical. That's utterly crucial to the redemption because that completed the emptying. See, while he was on this earth, every right choice he made, they could never touch him. They could curse him. They could lie about him. They could say everything they wanted about him, but they couldn't lay a hand on him. When he said, I'll go, they were free to do whatever they wanted. When he said, I'll go with you, he was giving himself over to the will of these sinful men who wanted his destruction. And he felt it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said that. But it's recorded for our benefit so that we know he felt the total, complete, ultimate separation from his Father. And it says when he did that, it says he gave up the ghost. It was over. At the end of the day, they would come because the next day was the Sabbath. They didn't want to leave him hanging up there on Sabbath day, so they'd break their legs, and then they couldn't hold themselves up, and they'd suffocate quickly, and then they could take him down. But they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead. And so one of the soldiers took a spear and shoved it into his side and came out blood and water. It came out in a flood. 
And that could only mean one thing. His heart had ruptured on the cross. And the body had emptied itself of all of its blood into the abdomen. When they put a spear in there, it all came out in one big rush. Again, it was a complete work. And when you take of this blood, remember that that flesh and blood body, that body that was made in our image, after our likeness, for our redemption, it was ripped open, and that blood was shed, and a price was paid. And eternal salvation is the result. The right to approach to the throne of God. To engage your heart. I love that phrase. I can't unsee that. Those three words. Who is this that draws nigh? Who has engaged his heart to approach me? Let's take of the of the juice here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, that paid the price for healing. That paid the price for deliverance from mental illness and insanity. It paid the price for our salvation. That was something that came back to us in the Holy Ghost and empowered us and gave gifts unto your church, miracle gifts, ministry gifts. You sacrificed it so much. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Be on high receive right now, wherever you're sitting. Be on high receive from the Lord right now. He said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. But he said, if you're going to remember me, understand what I did. Understand who I was. Understand why it happened. Understand what it took. And then do it in remembrance of me. High receive. Thank you, Lord. I feel there's a people in this room that are engaging their hearts right now, Lord, to approach unto you. And that's when stuff happens. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for every heart in this room that is thus engaged. Touch as only the hands that were nailed to the cross could touch. Touch. Touch your church. Touch your people. Thank you, Lord. Worship team, could you go back up and sing that hallelujah again? I can't praise him enough. But we can do what Paul did. You know, it says, A strong man armed keepeth his house, but if a stronger than he comes upon him and overpowers him, then that one will take his house from him. I was a strong man once, and I had control of my house. I knew who I was and what I was all about, but a stronger than me came and he took over my house. And I thought, I better get to know this guy because I can't deal with him. I can't oppose that kind of strength. I, I, I have no answer for that kind of strength, so I better find out who he is. You know, when you realize you've been subjected to somebody, you think, I gotta get to know the king. I got to get to know this guy. Because I can't oppose him. I can't fight him.
says the comforter has come. And truly there is comfort in the presence of the Lord. Like nothing else. And it's strength for the journey. It's the same spirit that raised him from the dead. In us. Christ in us. Hope of glory in us. In us. Saturating us through us. 